Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, the reason that I got into the flat earth debunking community to begin with was the fact that I was fascinated that people could in the 21st century still think that the earth was flat. Today I have a very nice video for you to review. This is a mirror from a gentleman by the name of Ideas Sleep Furiously. He's a small channel and the link to his video and channel is in the description. Now as we do this, I'm going to go ahead and put out short snippets of things that absolutely contradict the flat earth. So let's start off with the first one. It's early in the morning, the sun just came up, and I noted that when the sun came up, it was just to the north of due east. And I would like to know very much how the flat earth can explain this, considering the sun is currently 45 degrees south of my location here in Michigan. How can it possibly rise north of due east? So let's go on with ideas sleep furiously and why people deny science. This is a tube. Imagine we place a ball in the tube. What direction will it take when it comes out the other end? You've got two options, and the line represents the potential trajectory. Which one is correct? Answer in three, two, one. If you picked A, well done. Stick around for your gold star and a warm glow of superiority. But if you picked B, you're gonna need to stay behind after class, I'm afraid. But if you did get it wrong, don't feel too bad. So did over a third of undergrads when this study was carried out. And when the options looked like this, over half of them got it wrong. We get these things wrong because we're born with what psychologists call naive theories, which is a diplomatic way of saying wrong theories. We're born with a naive understanding of both physics and psychology. And this is a major cause of the adult resistance to science. This video is heavily indebted to one of my favourite articles on the topic by Paul Bloom and Dina Weisberg, so if you learn anything, you've probably learnt it from them, not me. Now much of what we know about adult resistance to science comes from experimental work in developmental psychology. We've figured out that babies know that objects are solid, persist over time, even when they're out of sight, fall to the ground if unsupported, and do not move unless acted upon. They also understand that people move autonomously in response to social and physical events, act and react in accord with their goals, and respond with appropriate emotions to different situations. So the problem with teaching science to children is, in the words of Professor Susan Carey, not what the student lacks, but what the student has. And here's a great example. It's not until around eight or nine years of age that children really understand the concept of a spherical Earth. That's right, all children under eight are flat earthers. Why? Because they think that unsupported objects will always fall. Now what's really interesting is our naive physics theories can often be overturned when we have experience with the objects involved. For example, let's go back to that curved tube. Imagine it's a water hose instead. Which direction does the water go? You see, when the question was asked like this, virtually nobody got it wrong. Now the moon is an interesting subject to the flat earth. We've known the exact distance to the moon since Project Diana in 1946, yet they still claim that it is small and local. We've not only found the distance with both radar and lasers, we've sent probes there and we've actually landed men who have walked on the moon. So how they can continue to claim that this is a small and local object, or worse yet, a luminary, despite the fact that you can clearly see shadows at the rims of these craters is beyond me. It has to do with the requirement to deny space and objects in orbit around the Earth. So let's continue with our discussion of ideas sleep furiously. So that's naive physics, but what about naive psychology? Well, children tend to see design and intention everywhere. And as Bloom and Weisberg write, four-year-olds insist that everything has a purpose, including lions to go in the zoo and clouds for raining 
a propensity called promiscuous teleology. Additionally, when asked about the origin of animals and people, children spontaneously tend to provide and prefer creationist explanations. Just as children's intuitions about the physical world make it difficult for them to accept that Earth is a sphere, their psychological intuitions about agency and design make it difficult for them to accept the processes of evolution. It's also important to realise that there are key cultural differences in the resistance to science. It's not just our innate view of the world which causes trouble. Americans, for example, are much less likely to accept evolution, and even the ones who do often aren't able to explain how natural selection works. And that's a clue as to why such cultural differences exist. Societies have differences in what's considered common knowledge and how it's referred to. Paul Bloom uses the fantastic example of the word dog. We all know what it refers to, so it's easy for children to learn. But what about the word germs or electricity? Nobody says, I believe in electricity, but that's not the case with evolution. People often say they believe in evolution, which implies that it's contestable. Of course, even if it were contestable, most of us don't have the skills or knowledge to contest it. Consider these five geostationary satellites located over the Amazon basin. You'll see them as small dots. I'm specifically tracking these using a piece of software called SkyTrack. Now, you have to ask yourself a couple of quick questions. Now, with the tracking on, you see the satellites as discrete little dots. There's three right there, and there's one there, and one there. When I turn the tracking software off, you'll see the stars now are in focus, but the satellites are streaked. Again, still in exactly the same formation as those first dots. A couple of questions that you have to ask yourself. Why are they still in such a tight formation? If I were to put up five random balloons, do you think they would continue to fly along at exactly the same speed in the exact formation that these satellites are showing? Second of all, how did I find these satellites? They're the size of a car and they're located thousands of miles away. I found them because I knew exactly where to look air in space in a well-known orbit. Now the flat Earth, in order to deal with this, has to first deny the existence of space and second, deny the existence of satellites in orbit around our spherical Earth. They have to claim that these are balloons somehow. I'll leave it up to you to decide if that makes any sense to you. So instead of contesting the evidence directly, we often use proxies. Perhaps the most popular proxy is the source of the information. This explains all those Americans who say they believe in evolution, but can't explain natural selection. They believe this because they believe that the source is trustworthy. We see this all the time with religious, political, and moral beliefs too. As Bloom and Weisberg write, in an illustrative recent study, participants were asked their opinion about a social welfare policy that was described as being endorsed by either Democrats or Republicans. Although the participants sincerely believed that their responses were based on the objective merits of the policy, the major determinant of what they thought of the policy was, in fact, whether or not their favoured political party was said to endorse it. Now whilst that's pretty damning evidence about our ability to deceive ourselves, we also do have a natural tendency toward scepticism, if the conditions are right. When five-year-olds hear about a competition whose outcome was unclear, they're more likely to believe a person who claimed that they had won the race than a person who had claimed that they had lost the race. Ultimately, however, this ability is severely constrained by everything else we've mentioned. The only reliable way our species has found for mitigating our personal biases is to essentially play them off against each other. This is what we call science. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out my Craving for Harmony two-part series where I discuss other impediments to seeing the world clearly. Well, I hope you found that interesting. Now, last week we started our discussion on star trails. These are star trails taken from the International Space Station in orbit around our Earth. There are a couple of key features. First, how does this star trail form? Second, why is the atmosphere and the surface of the Earth curved, yet the star trails themselves are not deformed? So, until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel, and we always appreciate your support as a Patreon or a member. Take care, guys. Too deep for me
Science guy. Bye bye bye, the science guy. Bye bye bye, the science guy.